if two masks are better than one, mm -hmm. are three masks better than two? Are four right. masks better than three? We got a section that I have uh, tentatively titled here, follow the science, but not that science, you fool. Um, so we have uh, published this, oh, actually, I guess a little over a week ago, um, a Wall Street Journal opinion piece, an op-ed. You can just show it very briefly here, Zach. Um, uh, called the Universal Vaccination Chimera. Tools for stopping variants are limited, and like masks and distancing, va vaccines are not a panacea. Uh, by a guy named Joseph A. Ladapo, who is an associate professor at the med school at UCLA. Uh, so I came to, I, I just in the last week, I found this because he and this piece were, were being discussed as if he was an anti-vaxxer. And increasingly, I distrust the assessment that someone is an anti-vaxxer, just like I now distrust the assessment someone is a racist or a fascist or alt-right or a Nazi or you know, a transphobe or any of these ridiculous epithets that are used to shut down discussion. And um, sure enough, this piece is not anti-vaccination <laughs> at all. It is saying, basically, um, that... Um, we need a multi-pronged approach to deal with this pandemic and that masks are some of the solution and that uh, distancing are some of the solution and that vaccines are not going to be a magic bullet, a panacea in his language. And so just to read, and you don't have to show my screen here, Zach, although I guess you could have, you know, um, the last two paragraphs of this Wall Street Journal op-ed are, other forces pushing mortality lower. The CDC estimates that approximately 83 million Americans contracted COVID-19 through December. Reinfection risk is low for at least six to nine months following infection. And just taking out of not quoting anymore, six to nine months, because that's how long we know. That's the, that's the, that's the length of time that we have data for this at this point. So, you know, in line with our earlier discussions about vaccines, where we really, really, really hope that these mRNA vaccines are awesome and that they have long-term safety, but we cannot know yet. Similarly, we cannot know about long-term reinfection risk for uh, COVID-19. To continue quoting from this Wall Street Journal op-ed uh, from February 4th, Ladapo says, there is also growing scientific evidence for outpatient therapies such as ivermectin, colchicine, fluvoxamine, and the politically charged hydroxychloroquine, as well as better hospital practices. A sharp decline in mortality will give rational thinking a bigger stage, allowing schools to reopen and social and economic activities to resume. It will also liberate American society from the fear-fueled decision-making that has dominated the pandemic response. Which isn't that, again, what we should all be looking for here. A reduction in fear, which is fueling a just insane level of incoherence in terms of the policies that we are seeing. So two, two pieces of evidence from this week about the ridiculosity, yes, the ridiculosity of the uh, responses that we're seeing. Here we have... <clears throat> Zach, if you would show briefly, from February 10th, three days ago, uh, officers at dorms, outdoor exercise ban. This is a terrible headline. UC Berkeley extends dorm lockdown with stricter mandates. So the message here is, okay, this is a terribly headlined article, Zach, if I may, um, so I can see my own notes on this. Um, UC Berkeley, you know, the one of the shining jewels of the UC system, um, has banned solitary outdoor exercise in order to tamp down the pandemic, I guess. But that means people are now locked in their dorm rooms with circulating air that they are sharing with other people. Yeah, it's almost certain that that policy will do harm to some people because some hours that would have been spent not in close contact with others um, will be spent in encapsulated with them. Mm -hmm. Without getting any fresh air, without getting any exercise, without seeing any other human beings, perhaps. Without making vitamin D. So this is actually all of this, going to intervene all of it. This is actually negative. going to make people sicker would be my prediction. Yep. Yes. And just the second piece of ridiculosity in um, terms of how, how efforts are proceeding to affect behavior. Um, I'll set this up by saying, um, <clears throat> increasingly, when I'm out on walks, <clears throat> even if I'm not within six, eight, 10, 12, 20 feet of people, um, and I have my mask in my hand, clearly ready to put it on if I do have to be close to people. Um, I am, you know, I've said this for months now, but I get, you know, I get the stink eye from people for not actually being outside wearing a mask. And you know, it's winter here. It's actually really wintry here right now. And 
uh, I want, it's, it's healthy. It's not just I want, but it is actually healthy for me and everyone will be healthier if they get exposure to the actual elements on their skin. And in the winter, your face is one of the few places that you can get that. So um, why are people so confused? I mean, in part, it's because people feel virtuous and on the right side of history for yelling at other people for not wearing masks. This is this is unfortunately the, the landscape we're in, and it comes from a place of fear and confusion, but that doesn't make it any easier to deal with. So this week I received um, the Oregon coronavirus update um, again on February 10th, and Zach, um, so this is just the web version of it so that... Um, so that you guys don't see the actual email, but it's the same thing. Campaign reminds us, masks save lives. Here's one picture. Cindy is a wildland firefighter from Southern Oregon. She wears a mask to protect her, she wears a mask to protect her crew from COVID-19, just like she protects Oregonians from fires. Okay, I don't see anyone else in that picture, but whatever, I'm not gonna focus here. This seems likely to not be the thing that is uh, necessary here, but if, you know, with her crew sitting in close quarters, okay. But the next picture here is Ethan is a rancher and pro bull rider from Eastern Oregon who wears his mask that we can so that we can return to normal life as soon as possible. And this picture, for those of you listening and not observing, is uh, a vast sort of Eastern Oregon chaparral scape. Um, endless rolling hills for as far as the eye can see, one person on a horse, no other people, no other horses, no other anything that might be transmitting this virus. And this guy's wearing a mask. And we are being shown this picture as evidence of how much he cares about us and as evidence that this is going to do anything to reduce transmission of COVID. I have looked. I may have missed it. Please, please, please share it with me somehow if there is new evidence that any of these new variants or even the older variant can spread outside. We covered in, I think, April, the evidence that was already out at that point, extensive evidence that this virus is not transmitting effectively outside. And certainly if there's no one around, where could you possibly be getting it? Right. Why? Why are we getting this insane advice? It is about widespread behavior control. I don't, I don't frankly care if it comes from a place of really feeling good about trying to help people and just being really confused. The effect is widespread behavior control. And those of us who are not interested in behaving in ways that confused authorities tell us to do are now occasionally getting yelled at by our neighbors when we are outside actually getting the wind and the sun on our face. So what's driving me crazy about this is that the advice is low quality and it has this kind of defect to it where the assumption is well it can't hurt right right exactly and the answer yes. is of course it can hurt right yes. to the extent that people are being driven crazy by lockdowns and don't want more of it you want to give them as much of a reprieve as you can to the extent that outdoors when you're not near other people is safe then the point is hey take your mask off the official advice ought to be when you are not around other people outdoors take your mask off mm -hmm. right and if we should put it on when we pass each other on the trail even though there is frankly no evidence that that is dangerous okay but um you know look the model that we built up was doesn't seem to transmit outdoors. That gives us a loophole that we can exploit for better psychological health, greater vitamin D creation, all of those positive benefits, right? We ought to protect it because it could evolve to transmit outdoors. It's one of the things that I would actually expect. And the way mm -hmm. to prevent it from doing that is to actually be more cautious than we should be, put masks on when we're, you know, standing in the ski line or whatever, even though there's no evidence that it transmits in, in those circumstances. And it didn't seem to have that, that evolutionary move did not seem to happen in the wake of the massive regular protests from last Northern summer. Right. But in any case, a rational course would be the place where we know you're safe is when you're not around other people outdoors and not around other people might mean 12 feet away, 
right? Mm -hmm. Right. 12 feet away, you can afford to have your mask down and not, you know, scowl at the other person for, you know, not wearing a mask, whatever it is. We can afford that reprieve. The risk is really, really low. As we get closer where it's more plausible that something could jump, we should be protective of the loophole so that it doesn't disappear on us. But we should not pretend that the point is I'm actually exposing you to, you know, right. a risk just because we're standing near each other outdoors. So the policy is I, just... I'm, I'm also, I'm sorry, I interrupt you, but I, like, I'm also really concerned concerned about caving to other people's fear. I and you know the fear is being generated and and curated and augmented by by government officials frankly and by you know these you know government officials at the state level and at the federal level and I assume elsewhere in the world as well. But then you have a populace that is increasingly just fearful and dysregulated and can't remember what normal was and is frankly having an ever harder time imagining that normal will ever be back. And in those conditions, especially, really any time, uh, but in those conditions especially, I don't, I, I think it's actually even more dangerous to say, I get that you're scared, I will just let your fear drive our behavior. No, that's like, that's the mistake of safetyism on campuses, of trigger warnings, of all of the stuff that created a whole dysregulated, unable to figure out how to move forward in the world popula uh, uh, generation of sort of, you know, the second half of of millennials and you know again just caveat we happen to be teaching college for like the entire millennial generation and almost to a person the students we met didn't need that stuff they didn't ask for it and when we said that's not how what we're going to do we are going to treat you with respect and we're going to challenge you and we're going to show you things that you don't like and that challenge your preconceived ideas and we're going to expose our biases and your biases and all of that and guess what people actually ended up educated and less fearful and more capable in the world and why the hell are we asking an entire really global population at this point to fall prey to the same garbagey garbagey ideology that is clearly causing higher ed to fail. Well, and at some level, to the extent that we push nonsensical, and by nonsensical, I mean doesn't match the empirical evidence uh, mask policy, yep. we are going to cause rebellion against it. You don't want to give people who are anti-mask, for example, more of a point than they should have. And to the extent that you're advocating things that don't make sense, um, you're doing exactly that. Now, I got taken to task this week. I tweeted something. I never know which tweets are going to take off, but this is one of my most popular tweets ever, okay. though I did I expected it to go not very far. My tweet was something like, um, if double masking uh, uh -oh. is that much, is, is so protective, why aren't they built that way in the first place? Now, this was an honest question, right? Because A, I don't buy that double masking is good. That does not mean that there are not combinations of masks that would be better. But here are the mm -hmm. questions that immediately arise in this context. Okay, COVID is a is transmitted. It's a respiratory virus. It's not. It's the reason that we have masks for uh, the protection of uh, people in the context of respiratory viruses. Is COVID different in some way that two masks are good for COVID and not for other things that are transmitted this way? In which case, that's interesting. But I want to see that. I want to see, oh, we've been making masks wrong the whole time. Lots of people have been getting sick, even though masks were used because the mask should have been twice as thick. And then we should make them twice as thick. Go ahead. Uh, so my my only rejoinder to you, and I think we did this over the dinner table, in fact, was the one reason, the one analysis that I have seen for the conditions under which two masks might be better than one. Well, I guess two. One is that the mask that you were wearing was a low quality mask to begin with. And in order to make a single high quality mask, you just want to double up two low quality masks that are low quality in different ways. Okay, great. Also, why don't you just get a high quality mask? So like that's that's one answer. And for, um, you know, for, for me, I'm wearing these masks that my mother is making. Thank you. And they're they're wonderful. And they have two layers of cloth and they have a layer of uh, of, of additional, I can't remember what the specifics are, mom, um, you know, of, of additional stuff in between the two cloth layers. And they fit my face really well and they're comfortable and they're awesome. And you can't tell by looking at it that it's not just a cheapo single cloth layer mask. And that's maybe unfortunate, but I know that I'm walking around when I'm masked and it is, you know, every time that I'm around strangers and anytime I'm indoors, it's not our home, um, that I'm wearing a single high quality mask. The one, the one place that I see, um, even if you've got two high-ish quality masks, is that if 
they fit your face somewhat differently, and each of them is a slightly imperfect fit, that potentially having the mask that fits better on top of the mask that fits worse can basically help it conform to your face better. That's great. Then we, right. need, then we need the information to be given to you so that you can figure out whether double masking is better, because here's the problem. Okay. If two masks are better than one, mm -hmm. are three masks better than two? Are four right. masks better than three? Right. right. There will come a point, I guarantee you, there will come a point at which extra masks start working against you because what they do is reduce the ability of air to transmit through them so it will go around. Now, my point would mm -hmm. be if you take a high quality mask that fits you well, and you layer another high quality mask on top of it, you are probably reducing its effectiveness. Therefore, it is not true that two masks are better than one. It's true that some combinations are better than a single mask of some type, right? Mm -hmm. But without telling us that, saying actually double, double masking might be a good idea, mm -hmm. right? You are going to create, again, this is another case where you are going to create more disease, just like telling people they shouldn't exercise outdoors alone, mm -hmm. right? You are going to create more disease because they're going to do something else. So you have to tell us what it is that we are trying to optimize so that we can operationalize it rather than you know, come up with some overly simplistic idea like two masks are better than one where we can now start scowling at people who are only wearing one mask, right? That is destined to do harm. And the fact that um, that we we aren't having the conversation, right? Right? It's clear what the pattern is. You've got, you had one mask, now we're being told two. Can we fast forward and find out what you're going to say about three, right? We ought to know. Everyone wants simple rubrics. And, um, especially because this is confusing and I would argue some of this is intentionally confusing. This is being made more confusing than it need be for reasons that um, I will remain agnostic on for now. Um, a friend of ours told me a story this week that she experienced uh, several weeks ago in which she's in a grocery store and there's some dude with a you know, imperfectly fitted mask who is on his phone the whole time talking loudly through his phone when therefore, you know, talking, we know, spreads viral particles much more than being quiet, talking loudly, presumably because he's talking through his mask and he's picking up all this produce and putting it down. And yes, fomites don't seem to be a big cause, but like, you know, most of us are trying to be a lot more careful about not handling a lot of stuff that we're not actually going to buy in store. So he's picking up all this produce and he's talking loudly on his phone the whole time. And he's presumably his own little, you know, if he, if he was sick, he was spreading this stuff. And so as um, they happened to check out around the same time, and as she was preparing to go out into the winter weather, she had to adjust something here and briefly took off her mask in order to get herself adjusted. And he walked by and saw her and voiced a nasty, snarky comment about how masks are keeping us safe and why doesn't she care? It was the guy who was behaving... Uh, Despicably, frankly. Yeah, you're right. It's the, it's the simple rubric problem. It's the simple rubric problem. The fact that he was wearing a mask and behaving in every single other way badly with regard to how to reduce the chances that if he were sick, he was going to get other people sick didn't affect him at all. It's like it didn't enter into his worldview and he could still feel all high and mighty whenever he saw anyone who was for a moment doing the one thing that we are told we all must do if you care about your friends and neighbors. So those of us who can think I think mm -hmm. are having a problem with a complete failure to do any net analysis, right? Yeah. There is a sense that um, that which might help is should be policy, right? Well, it might be that somebody is going to catch the virus from you outdoors while you're exercising alone. So let's have you not do that with no understanding that you will therefore do something else where it's more likely to get transmitted, mm -hmm. right? So the point is this is a, at best, well-intended policy that is likely to kill, right? Um, I would argue that the two mask thing is too. Does that mean that most people's mask choice wouldn't be better doubled? It might well be, but we need to know what we're optimizing before we know whether or not we should double our mask. If you're wearing a mask with one of those vents in it, I'd like you to double mask because those masks with vents in them, they don't protect the rest of us at all, right? right. Like there are some masks that are crap and no one should be wearing them. Right. Right.